20 Famous Gay Celebrities Who Died of AIDS Welcome to our channel, The Famous People. In this video, we'll take you through the extraordinary lives of 20 influential figures whose talent shaped music, film, and art, but whose journeys were tragically cut short by AIDS. Their stories are filled with creativity, courage, and personal struggles that continue to inspire and resonate today. Stay with us as we delve into how their legacies still impact culture and bring awareness to important causes. Freddie Mercury Freddie Mercury, born Farouk Bulsara in Zanzibar, is celebrated as the legendary frontman of Queen, whose flamboyant persona and unparalleled vocal range left an indelible mark on music. His four-octave voice and captivating stage presence catapulted him to fame, turning him into one of rock's most iconic figures. While his personal life often remained out of the public eye, close friends were aware of his relationships, including his enduring bond with Mary Austin, whom he considered his soulmate, and his later partnership with Jim Hutton. Though Mercury never officially came out, his sexuality was well known within his inner circle. In 1987, he was diagnosed with HIV, but chose to keep this deeply personal battle private, even as he continued to create some of his most memorable work. His commitment to music never wavered, and he played a pivotal role in producing Queen's Innuendo album, with his final on-screen appearance in the music video for These Are The Days Of Our Lives, where his visibly frail but determined presence touched fans worldwide. On November 23, 1991, just a day before his passing, Mercury publicly acknowledged his AIDS diagnosis. He died on November 24, 1991, from bronchial pneumonia caused by AIDS, leaving behind a legacy as one of the greatest performers in rock history. His impact lives on not only through his music, but also through the Mercury Phoenix Trust, a charity established in his name to combat AIDS globally, continuing his influence long after his death. Wade Dominguez Wade Dominguez was an emerging talent in Hollywood whose promising career was tragically cut short. Born on May 10, 1966, in Santa Clara County, California, Dominguez was of Mexican and French descent, a heritage that gave him a striking and unique look. Before becoming an actor, he worked as a go-go dancer in nightclubs, using dance to express himself while honing his performance skills. His breakthrough role came in 1995, when he starred alongside Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds, playing the character Emilio Ramirez, a troubled student who undergoes a transformation under his teacher's guidance. His raw and authentic performance resonated with audiences and critics alike, solidifying his place as a rising star. Dominguez's work extended beyond Dangerous Minds, with roles in films like City of Industry, The Taxman, and Shadow of Doubt, showcasing his versatility as an actor. Despite the success and recognition, Dominguez kept his personal life private, especially his battle with AIDS, which was not publicly known during his career. He chose to be remembered for his talent rather than his illness. Sadly, Dominguez passed away on August 26, 1998, at the young age of 32, due to respiratory failure caused by complications from AIDS. His death shocked many, as his condition had been kept secret. One of the most poignant moments of his final days was when his friend and co-star, Elizabeth Berkeley showed him a rough cut of The Taxman, his last film. Overwhelmed by the emotional impact of his performance, Dominguez reportedly broke down in tears, a bittersweet reminder of the talent the world lost far too soon. Willie Smith Willie Smith, born in 1948 in Philadelphia, was a groundbreaking fashion designer whose vision redefined streetwear and made high fashion accessible to the masses. Often referred to as the godfather of streetwear, Smith's designs blended casual sportswear with sophisticated avant-garde elements, creating clothing that was stylish, affordable, and wearable by everyday people. His brand, Willyware, launched in 1976, became a fashion phenomenon with Smith's bold philosophy. 
I don't design clothes for the queen, but for the people who wave at her as she goes by. Smith's designs stood out for their cultural relevance and inclusivity, as he sought to blur the lines between traditional high fashion and urban street style. His success extended beyond fashion, collaborating with artists, dancers, and filmmakers to merge different art forms with his clothing. One of his notable contributions to pop culture was designing the wedding dress for the comic book character Mary Jane Watson in the Amazing Spider-Man comics, further cementing his influence. Smith's personal life was equally intertwined with his professional work. He partnered both in business and life with his collaborator, Lan Barker. Unfortunately, in the mid-1980s, the HIV-AIDS crisis began to take its toll. Barker passed away from AIDS-related cancer, and soon after, Smith's own health started to deteriorate. He was hospitalized with shingles and other conditions associated with AIDS, and on April 17, 1987, Willie Smith passed away at the age of 39. Denholm Elliott Denholm Elliott, born on May 31, 1922, in London, England, was a versatile and beloved British character actor who left an indelible mark on both cinema and television. Known for his ability to play quirky, often befuddled but endearing characters, Elliott's career spanned over four decades, during which he appeared in more than 125 films and TV shows. He was a staple of British cinema and audiences worldwide recognized him for his memorable roles in films like Raiders of the Lost Ark as Marcus Brody and Trading Places as Coleman. Elliot's journey to acting was anything but ordinary. During World War II, he served in the Royal Air Force and spent three years as a prisoner of war. After the war, he pursued his passion for acting, quickly becoming one of Britain's most reliable character actors, earning the respect of both colleagues and audiences alike. His distinctive ability to steal scenes with subtle gestures or a well-timed line became his trademark, and he gained a reputation as an actor who could elevate any role, no matter how small. While Elliot enjoyed immense professional success, his personal life was more complex. Although he was married twice and had two children, Elliot was also bisexual, a fact he kept private for much of his life. In 1987, he was diagnosed with HIV but continued working through his illness, appearing in several films and TV series until his health began to decline. Denholm Elliott passed away on October 6, 1992, at the age of 70, from AIDS-related tuberculosis at his home in Ibiza, Spain. His death shocked the entertainment world, but his legacy lived on. In recognition of his significant contributions to British cinema, the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, BAFTA, named an award in his honor, ensuring that future generations of actors would be inspired by his remarkable talent and dedication to his craft. Robert Reed Robert Reed, born John Robert Reitz Jr. on October 19, 1932 in Highland Park, Illinois, was best known for his iconic role as the fatherly Mike Brady on The Brady Bunch. Reed's portrayal of the wise and gentle patriarch made him a household name and cemented his status as one of television's most beloved figures. However, behind the scenes, his life was far more complicated than the wholesome image he projected on screen. Reed began his acting career on stage, honing his craft in various theater productions before transitioning to television in the early 1960s. His breakout came when he was cast in The Brady Bunch, which ran from 1969 to 1974 and became a cultural phenomenon. Despite his success, Reed often struggled with the show's lighthearted tone and simplicity, believing that it didn't reflect the depth of acting he desired. He frequently clashed with producers over the quality of scripts and storylines, but he took his role as a father figure seriously, even off-screen, as he bonded with the young cast members and guided them in their careers and personal lives. While his professional life thrived, Reed faced internal conflicts regarding his sexuality. Although he married Marilyn Rosenberger in 1954 and had a daughter, Karen, the marriage ended after five years. 
Reed confided in Marilyn about his homosexuality, a secret he kept from the public for most of his life due to fear that coming out could ruin his career during a time when Hollywood was far less accepting of LGBTQ plus individuals. In 1991, Reed was diagnosed with colon cancer, and it was later revealed that he was also HIV positive, though the timeline of when he contracted the virus remains unclear. On May 12, 1992, Robert Reed passed away at the age of 59. While colon cancer was listed as the primary cause of death, complications from HIV are believed to have contributed significantly. His death shocked his fans, and the revelation of his HIV status after his passing brought attention to the stigma many LGBTQ plus individuals faced during his lifetime. Reed's legacy endures through his role as the ever-loved Mike Brady and his profound impact on television history. Edcock Edcock, born Edward Irving Koch, on December 12, 1924, in the Bronx, New York, was a larger-than-life figure best known for his three terms as the mayor of New York City from 1978 to 1989. His tenure as mayor coincided with some of the city's most turbulent times, and Koch's charismatic, often brash personality made him a defining figure of 1980s New York. His signature phrase, How am I doing? became iconic as he worked to connect with New Yorkers and turn the city around from financial crisis and urban decay. Koch entered politics after serving in World War II, becoming a lawyer and then a congressman before being elected mayor. During his time in office, he was credited with stabilizing the city's finances and helping to revitalize many parts of New York. However, his legacy is not without controversy, particularly regarding his response to the AIDS epidemic. As the disease ravaged New York's gay community in the early 1980s, Koch's administration faced sharp criticism for not doing enough to address the crisis. Activists, including playwright Larry Kramer, condemned Koch for what they saw as an inadequate response, and some speculated that his closeted sexuality may have contributed to his hesitancy in addressing the epidemic more directly. Despite persistent rumors about his sexuality, Koch never publicly came out as gay during his lifetime, maintaining that his private life was his own business. After his death, some close friends, including journalist Charles Kaiser, confirmed that Koch was gay, but that he chose not to come out due to the political climate of the time. Koch's political career was marked by notable achievements, including his efforts to ban discrimination against gay people in city employment and housing. After leaving office, he remained a public figure, writing books, hosting a radio show, and even serving as a judge on the People's Court. Koch passed away on February 1, 2013, at the age of 88, leaving behind a complex legacy that continues to be debated. While his impact on New York City's recovery is widely acknowledged, his handling of the AIDS crisis and his personal decisions regarding his sexuality remain subjects of discussion. Roy Cohn Roy Cohn, born on February 20, 1927 in New York City, was a highly influential and controversial lawyer and political figure who played a pivotal role in shaping American politics during the mid-20th century. Known for his aggressive and often ruthless legal tactics, Cohn first gained national prominence as the chief counsel to Senator Joseph McCarthy during the infamous Army McCarthy hearings in the 1950s. These hearings were a key part of McCarthy's anti-communist crusade, which became known as the Red Scare. Cohn was instrumental in the prosecution of suspected communists, and his work during this time left a lasting, polarizing mark on American history. Cohn's influence extended beyond the hunt for communists. He was also a major player in what became known as the Lavender Scare, a parallel persecution of LGBTQ plus individuals in government positions. Ironically, Cohn himself was widely rumored to be gay, though he vehemently denied it throughout his life. His role in the Lavender Scare, where he helped to purge LGBTQ plus individuals from government positions, was seen by many as hypocritical given his own private life. After his work with McCarthy, 
Cohn transitioned into private practice, where he represented a wide range of high-profile clients, including business tycoon Donald Trump, media magnate Rupert Murdoch, and several mafia figures. His aggressive, often unethical tactics made him a feared and powerful figure in legal and political circles. Despite numerous accusations of corruption, Cohn continued to wield significant influence throughout his career. In 1984, Cohn was diagnosed with HIV, a fact he kept secret until his death. To the public and even to some of his closest associates, Cohn insisted that he was suffering from liver cancer, never acknowledging his HIV diagnosis or his sexuality. On August 2, 1986, Roy Cohn passed away at the age of 59 from AIDS-related complications. His refusal to publicly admit his sexuality or HIV status added to the complex and contradictory nature of his legacy. Cohn remains a deeply controversial figure, remembered both for his role in shaping American politics during a time of paranoia and fear, and for the personal contradictions he embodied as a persecutor of LGBTQ plus individuals while likely living as a closeted gay man. His life and career continue to be the subject of debate and analysis, especially in light of the lasting impact of the McCarthy era and the Lavender Scare. Andre Nepella Andre Nepella, born on January 22, 1951 in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, now Slovakia, was one of the most celebrated figure skaters of his time. Nepella's career began when he was just seven years old, initially as a way to combat asthma. However, his natural talent on the ice quickly became apparent, and by the age of 13, he was already competing at the international level, representing Czechoslovakia. Known for his elegant style and technical precision, Napella's rise in the world of figure skating was meteoric. His crowning achievement came at the 1972 Winter Olympics in Sapporo, Japan, where he won the gold medal in men's singles figure skating. This victory was the pinnacle of a career that also saw him secure three world championships and five European championships, making him one of the most decorated skaters of his era. His artistry and precision on the ice earned him the nickname the Ice Prince, and he became a national hero in Czechoslovakia. After retiring from competitive skating in 1973, Napella continued his involvement in the sport as a professional skater and later as a coach. He toured with Holiday on Ice and eventually settled in Germany, where he trained a new generation of skaters. His experience and expertise made him a respected figure in the international skating community. Despite his success on the ice, Napella was a private individual who kept much of his personal life, including his relationships, out of the public eye. In the late 1980s, his health began to decline, and he was diagnosed with cancer of the lymph nodes. There was speculation within the skating community that his illness may have been related to AIDS, but these details remained unconfirmed. Andre Nepella passed away on February 2, 1989, at the age of 38. His early death was a tragic loss to the skating world, but his legacy as one of the greatest figure skaters in history endures. Today, the Andre Nepella Memorial, an annual international figure skating competition held in Bratislava, honors his incredible achievements and lasting impact on the sport, Brad Davis. Brad Davis, born Robert Creel Davis on November 6, 1949, in Tallahassee, Florida, was a gifted actor whose career shined brightly but was tragically cut short. Best known for his riveting performance as Billy Hayes in the 1978 film Midnight Express, Davis garnered widespread acclaim for his portrayal of an American student imprisoned in Turkey on drug smuggling charges. His raw and intense performance earned him a Golden Globe Award and solidified his place as one of Hollywood's rising stars. Davis's early life was marked by hardship, growing up in a tumultuous family environment with a father who struggled with alcoholism. Despite these challenges, he discovered a passion for acting and moved to New York City as a teenager to pursue his dream. 
He studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and began working in off-Broadway productions, steadily building his reputation as a talented and dedicated performer. In addition to Midnight Express, Davis took on a number of complex and controversial roles. He starred in German filmmaker Rainer Werner Fassbinder's Quarell, 1982, in which he portrayed a sailor exploring his sexuality, a performance that earned him attention as a gay icon despite his own ambiguous relationship with his sexual identity. Though married to Susan Bluestein and father to a daughter, Rumors about Davis's sexuality persisted, though his family maintained that these roles were simply part of his craft. Behind his professional success, Davis struggled with drug and alcohol addiction, which plagued much of his adult life. In 1985, he was diagnosed with AIDS at a time when the disease was still highly stigmatized. For six years, Davis kept his diagnosis a secret confiding only in his closest friends and family. Despite his declining health, he continued to work, appearing in television shows and films while undergoing experimental treatments for the disease. Brad Davis passed away on September 8, 1991, at the age of 41. In a decision that sparked controversy, he chose to end his life through assisted suicide, hoping to spare his family the pain of watching him deteriorate from the disease. His wife, Susan Bluestein, later published a book titled After Midnight, The Life and Death of Brad Davis, offering a poignant insight into his struggles with addiction, his battle with AIDS, and his complex private life. Davis's legacy remains one of an incredibly talented actor who was taken far too soon, leaving behind unforgettable performances that continue to resonate with audiences. Rudolf Nureyev Rudolf Nureyev, born on March 17, 1938, on a train near Irkutsk, Siberia, was one of the most celebrated and influential ballet dancers of the 20th century. His extraordinary talent, intense passion for dance, and defiance of convention revolutionized the art of ballet. Nureyev grew up in Soviet Russia under modest circumstances, but his early involvement in a folk dance group quickly revealed his exceptional gift for movement. He went on to train at the prestigious Vaganova Academy in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Petersburg, where his career took flight. In 1961, Nureyev made a bold and history-changing decision during a tour with the Kirov Ballet in Paris. He defected to the West, seeking political asylum. This defection at the height of the Cold War made headlines worldwide and marked the beginning of his illustrious international career. His electrifying performances and groundbreaking collaborations with prima ballerina Margot Fontaine became legendary. Their interpretations of Romeo and Juliet and Swan Lake are still considered some of the finest in ballet history. Nureyev was more than just a performer. He sought to reshape the very art of ballet. He brought a new level of athleticism to male roles, demanding more substantial and dynamic parts for male dancers. As the artistic director of the Paris Opera Ballet later in his career, Nureyev pushed boundaries and nurtured a new generation of talent. Offstage, Nureyev was known for his flamboyant lifestyle, complicated personality, and openness about his relationships with men, though in earlier years he kept aspects of his sexuality private. Despite being diagnosed with HIV in the 1980s, Nureyev continued to work tirelessly. He choreographed, conducted, and even danced when his health allowed it. Tragically, Nureyev succumbed to AIDS-related complications on January 6, 1993, at the age of 54. His legacy lives on as one of the greatest and most influential dancers of all time, who brought ballet to new artistic heights and captivated audiences around the world. Rock Hudson Rock Hudson, born Roy Harold Scherer Jr. on November 17, 1925, in Winnetka, Illinois, epitomized the classic Hollywood leading man. With his tall stature, rugged good looks, and charm, Hudson became one of the biggest stars of the 1950s and 1960s. 
His rise to fame began with romantic dramas like Magnificent Obsession, 1954, and All That Heaven Allows, 1955. However, it was his role alongside Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean in Giant, 1956, that earned him an Academy Award nomination and solidified his place as a Hollywood legend. Hudson's on-screen persona as a masculine and desirable leading man was carefully crafted by Hollywood studios, which helped maintain a facade of heterosexuality in an era when being openly gay could ruin a career. To protect his public image, Hudson entered into a brief marriage with Phyllis Gates, his agent's secretary, but it was later revealed to be orchestrated to quash rumors about his sexuality. Despite this public front, Hudson's private life was an open secret in Hollywood circles, where he was known for hosting lavish parties at his Beverly Hills mansion. In the 1970s, Hudson successfully transitioned to television, starring in the popular series Macmillan and Wife, and gaining a new generation of fans. However, in 1984, Hudson's life took a dramatic turn when he was diagnosed with AIDS. As his health visibly declined, rumors about his condition began to spread. In July 1985, during a public appearance, his gaunt and frail appearance raised further speculation, leading to his publicist confirming on July 25, 1985, that Hudson had AIDS. This announcement shocked the world, as Hudson became the first major celebrity to go public with the disease. Hudson's openness about his diagnosis in his final months helped to destigmatize AIDS and brought much needed attention to the epidemic at a time when misconceptions and fear dominated public perception. Rock Hudson passed away on October 2, 1985, at the age of 59. His death was a watershed moment, igniting conversations about HIV, AIDS, and LGBTQ rights. His bravery in his final days, combined with his legendary career, left an enduring legacy in Hollywood and beyond. Liberace Waju Valentino Liberace, better known simply as Liberace, was born on May 16, 1919, in West Allis, Wisconsin. He rose to fame as one of the most flamboyant and charismatic entertainers of the 20th century. With his extraordinary talent as a pianist, combined with his theatrical performances, Liberace became a household name, known for his over-the-top costumes, lavish sets, and his signature candelabra atop his grand piano. His performances were more than just concerts. They were full-scale spectacles, earning him the title Mr. Showmanship. Liberace's unique blend of classical music with popular tunes allowed him to reach a wide audience, and by the 1950s, his television program, The Liberace Show, made him a beloved figure in American homes. He became the highest paid entertainer in the world during his peak, thanks to his concerts, TV shows, and Las Vegas performances. His charm, humor, and style made him unforgettable, but he was also known for fiercely guarding his private life. Throughout his career, Liberace faced rumors about his sexuality. He consistently denied being gay, famously suing the British tabloid The Daily Mirror in 1956 for implying he was homosexual and winning the case. Behind closed doors, however, Liberace had long-term relationships with men, including a much-publicized affair with his former chauffeur and alleged lover, Scott Thorson. Their tumultuous relationship became the subject of lawsuits and public scandal, but Liberace continued to deny any allegations related to his sexual orientation. As the AIDS crisis unfolded in the 1980s, Liberace's health began to decline. Despite growing visibly frail, he continued to insist that his gaunt appearance was due to a strict watermelon diet. Liberace gave his final public performance at Radio City Music Hall in November 1986. Just a few months later, on February 4, 1987, he passed away at his home in Palm Springs, California, at the age of 67. Although his doctor initially claimed that he died from heart failure, 
An autopsy later confirmed that the cause of death was AIDS-related pneumonia. Liberace's life and career remain iconic, and his influence on the entertainment industry is still felt today, especially in how he embraced spectacle and extravagance as key elements of his performances. Pedro Zamora Pedro Zamora, born on February 29, 1972, in Havana, Cuba, was a groundbreaking advocate for HIV, AIDS awareness, and LGBTQ rights. He moved to the United States at the age of eight with his family, settling in Miami, Florida. By the time he was a teenager, Zamora was already open about his sexuality, a rare and courageous stance within the Cuban-American community of the time. At just 17, Pedro was diagnosed with HIV, a revelation that would transform his life and lead him on a mission to educate others, especially young people, about the realities of HIV AIDS. Rather than letting his diagnosis defeat him, Zamora became a vocal advocate, traveling across the United States to share his story and raise awareness about the disease. His charisma and passion made him a powerful educator, able to break down the stigma and misconceptions surrounding HIV AIDS. His efforts focused particularly on reaching younger audiences who, like him, were at risk but often underinformed about the disease. In 1994, Pedro Zamora was cast in the real world, San Francisco, making him one of the first openly gay men with HIV to appear on mainstream television. His presence on the show brought the realities of living with HIV into millions of homes across America. Pedro's relationship with his partner, Sean Sasser, became one of the first same-sex relationships to be portrayed on television, further breaking down barriers and raising visibility for LGBTQ issues. Their commitment ceremony, broadcast during the show, was a landmark moment in television history. Tragically, as the real world continued filming, Pedro's health began to deteriorate due to complications from AIDS. He was diagnosed with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, a rare brain infection. Despite his declining health, Pedro remained committed to his advocacy, raising awareness until the very end. On November 11, 1994, just hours after the final episode of The Real World, San Francisco, aired, Pedro Zamora passed away at the age of 22. Pedro's bravery in sharing his story with the world helped destigmatize HIV AIDS and humanize the disease for many who had previously only viewed it through the lens of fear. His work was praised by figures like President Bill Clinton, who recognized the profound impact Pedro had on raising awareness and changing perceptions about HIV AIDS. Though his life was tragically short, Pedro Zamora's legacy as a trailblazer in HIV AIDS education and LGBTQ representation endures, inspiring generations to fight against stigma and discrimination. Howard Ashman Howard Ashman, born on May 17, 1950 in Baltimore, Maryland, was a visionary lyricist and playwright whose work left an indelible mark on Disney's most beloved animated films. Ashman was instrumental in bringing the magic of musical theater to Disney, playing a key role in the studio's resurgence during the late 1980s and early 1990s, a period known as the Disney Renaissance. Ashman's talent for storytelling through song, combined with his deep love for musical theater, transformed the way animated films integrated music into their narratives. Before his work with Disney, Ashman had already established a strong reputation in musical theater, particularly with his smash hit collaboration with composer Alan Menken on Little Shop of Horrors. The duo's chemistry was magical, and their success on Broadway caught Disney's attention. In 1986, Ashman and Menken were hired by Disney to write the songs for The Little Mermaid, 1989. Their work on the film was groundbreaking, with iconic songs like Under the Sea and Part of Your World becoming instant classics. The film's success helped revitalize Disney's animation department and earned Ashman his first Academy Award. Ashman's contributions didn't stop there. 
He continued to collaborate with Mencken on Beauty and the Beast, 1991, writing songs that are still cherished today, such as Be Our Guest and Beauty and the Beast. However, during the production of the film, Ashman was diagnosed with AIDS. Despite his illness, Ashman poured his heart into the project, knowing it would likely be his last. Many of the film's themes and lyrics took on deeper, more poignant meanings, such as the fear of the unknown and societal rejection depicted in The Mob Song. Ashman also worked on Aladdin, 1992, writing several key songs before his health deteriorated. He passed away on March 14, 1991, at the age of 40, just before Beauty and the Beast was released. The film went on to become a monumental success, and in a touching tribute, the end credits were dedicated to Ashman. To our friend Howard, who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul, we will be forever grateful. Steve Rubell Steve Rubell, born on December 2, 1943 in Brooklyn, New York, was a nightlife mogul and co-founder of the legendary nightclub Studio 54, which defined the disco era of the late 1970s. Rubel's journey to becoming the king of New York City's nightlife began after graduating from Syracuse University and a brief stint in restaurant management. Alongside his business partner and college friend, Ian Schrager, Rubel transformed an old CBS television studio in Manhattan into the most famous and exclusive club in the world, Studio 54. When Studio 54 opened its doors on April 26, 1977, it quickly became the epicenter of New York's nightlife, attracting celebrities, artists, and everyday people alike. The club's strict door policy, overseen by Rubel himself, created an air of exclusivity and mystery. On any given night, one could find Andy Warhol, Liza Minnelli, Mick Jagger, or Diana Ross mingling with the crowd, dancing the night away under glittering lights and disco balls. Rubel's famous quote, the key to a good party is filling a room with guests more interesting than you, epitomized the club's ethos. However, the high life at Studio 54 came to an abrupt halt in December 1978 when the club was raided by the IRS. Rubel and Schrager were convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to three and a half years in prison, although they only served 13 months. Despite the downfall of Studio 54, Rubel's influence on nightlife remained significant. After his release, he and Schrager pivoted to the hotel industry, pioneering the concept of boutique hotels with the opening of Morgan's Hotel in New York, which became a major success. In 1985, Rubel was diagnosed with HIV, though he kept his diagnosis private. Despite his declining health, he continued to work and socialize in New York's nightlife scene. Tragically, Rubel's health worsened, and he developed complications from AIDS. On July 25, 1989, Steve Rubel passed away from hepatitis and septic shock, both related to AIDS, at the age of 45. Anthony Perkins Anthony Perkins born on April 4, 1932, in New York City, was an American actor best known for his chilling portrayal of Norman Bates in Alfred Hitchcock's classic film Psycho, 1960. His performance as the disturbed motel owner became iconic, both elevating his career and, in some ways, overshadowing his other work. However, Perkins was a versatile and talented actor whose career spanned theater, film, and television, leaving a lasting impact on Hollywood. Perkins came from a theatrical family. His father, Osgood Perkins, was a well-known stage actor which likely influenced his decision to pursue acting. He got his big break early, earning an Academy Award nomination for his role in Friendly Persuasion, 1956, where he played a sensitive young Quaker, this role established him as a promising young actor, but it was his role as Norman Bates that would define him. His chilling performance in Psycho made him a horror legend, but it also led to typecasting, as many audiences struggled to separate the actor from his most famous character. Despite his fame, Perkins led a deeply private personal life. 
He was romantically linked to several men during his early years in Hollywood, including actor Tab Hunter, but like many gay actors of the time, Perkins kept his sexuality secret to protect his career. In 1973, he married photographer Barry Berenson, and the couple had two sons together. Although friends described the marriage as happy, it is widely believed that Perkins never fully reconciled his sexuality. In 1986, Perkins was diagnosed with HIV, but he kept his illness hidden from the public. It wasn't until after his death from AIDS-related pneumonia on September 12, 1992, at the age of 60, that his diagnosis became widely known. His passing was a poignant reminder of the ongoing AIDS epidemic, and it highlighted the stigma surrounding the disease, especially for closeted gay men in Hollywood. Tragically, Perkins' widow, Barry Berenson, also met an untimely death as a passenger on American Airlines Flight 11, which was hijacked during the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Perkins' legacy as a talented and nuanced actor, as well as a tragic figure caught in Hollywood's prejudices of the time, remains strong. His performance as Norman Bates continues to inspire actors and filmmakers, and his contributions to film and theater endure Stephen Stucker. Stephen Stucker, born on July 2, 1947 in Des Moines, Iowa, was a gifted comedic actor best remembered for his scene-stealing performances in the airplane films. With his manic energy, quick wit, and improvisational talent, Stucker became a beloved figure in the comedy genre, leaving a lasting impact with his unforgettable and hilarious roles. Stucker's early career began in theater, where he honed his comedic chops in various productions. His big break came when he was cast in the Zucker Abrahams and Zucker film Kentucky Fried Movie, 1977, a comedy sketch film that earned a cult following. However, it was his role in Airplane, 1980, as Johnny, the wisecracking air traffic controller, that cemented his status as a comedic legend. Stucker's character, who delivered off-the-wall one-liners and bizarre non-sequiturs, became an audience favorite. His unique ability to inject energy and humor into any scene, often through ad-libs, made him a standout in an already star-studded cast. He reprised the role in Airplane 2, the sequel, 1982, further solidifying his comedic legacy. Despite his success on screen, Stucker faced personal challenges. In 1984, he was diagnosed with HIV, a diagnosis he bravely chose to make public at a time when few celebrities were willing to speak openly about the disease. Stucker became one of the first actors in Hollywood to openly discuss his HIV status, helping to bring awareness to the AIDS crisis. His decision to speak out was courageous, given the stigma and fear surrounding the disease during the 1980s. Stucker's battle with AIDS was brief. He passed away on April 13, 1986 at the age of 38. His openness about his diagnosis helped destigmatize the disease and provided representation for those suffering in silence. Although his career was tragically cut short, Stephen Stucker's legacy as a trailblazing comedic actor and one of the earliest public figures to confront the AIDS crisis remains significant. His performances, particularly in Airplane, continue to make audiences laugh, ensuring that his comedic brilliance lives on. Paul Shannar. Paul Shannar, born on February 12, 1936, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was a versatile American actor known for his intense screen presence and ability to play complex characters, both heroic and villainous. With a deep, commanding voice and a refined stage presence, Shannar was admired in both theater and film. His career began on the stage, where he was a founding member of the American Conservatory Theater, ACT, in San Francisco, one of the most respected regional theaters in the country. His work there helped establish him as a formidable talent. Shainar made a seamless transition to film and television, where he delivered memorable performances. His most well-known role came in the 1983 classic crime film Scarface, in which he portrayed the drug lord Alejandro Sosa. His portrayal of Sosa, 
a calm yet menacing antagonist, was both chilling and captivating, earning him critical praise and leaving a lasting impression on audiences. Beyond Scarface, Shinar appeared in a number of television productions and films, including The Secret of NIMH, 1982, Zorro, The Gay Blade, 1981, and Roots, 1977, where he showcased his range and dedication to his craft. While Shinar's professional life was well documented, his personal life was kept mostly private. However, rumors circulated about a relationship with British actor Jeremy Brett, best known for his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. If true, the relationship remained out of the public eye, a common practice among gay actors of the time due to the social and career risks of being openly gay in Hollywood. Sadly, Paul Shinar's life was cut short by complications related to AIDS. He passed away on October 11, 1989, at the age of 53. His death came at a time when the AIDS epidemic was taking the lives of many in the entertainment industry. Though his career did not reach the same heights as some of his contemporaries, Shinar's performances, particularly his portrayal of Sosa in Scarface, remain iconic, and his contributions to both stage and screen are remembered fondly by fans and colleagues alike. Joel Crothers Joel Crothers, born on January 28, 1941, in Cincinnati, Ohio, was a popular television actor best known for his long-running roles in daytime soap operas. A talented performer from a young age, he began his acting career on Broadway at the age of 14, appearing in the original production of The Young and the Beautiful, 1955. His early success on stage helped launch a career that would see him become a beloved figure in the world of daytime television, Crowther's breakthrough came in the 1960s when he was cast in the supernatural soap opera Dark Shadows, where he played the role of Joe Haskell. His character became a fan favorite, and Crowther's good looks and on-screen charm helped solidify his place in the world of soaps. He later appeared in other popular soap operas, including The Edge of Night and Somerset, where he played central roles that kept him in the hearts of television viewers for over two decades. Despite his success on screen, Crowther's led a double life. Among his friends, family, and colleagues, he was openly gay, but he chose not to discuss his sexuality publicly. This was a common practice for many actors during a time when being openly gay could potentially end a career in Hollywood. An interesting chapter of his life was his engagement to actress Veleka Gray, his on-screen love interest on Somerset. Whether the engagement was genuine or a way to maintain public appearances remains a matter of speculation. Tragically, Joel Crowther's life was cut short when he passed away from AIDS-related lymphoma on November 6, 1985, at the age of 44. His death, like many in the entertainment industry at the time, highlighted the devastating impact of the AIDS epidemic. Crowther's left behind a legacy as one of the most beloved soap opera stars of his era, remembered for his dedication to his craft and his charming heartfelt performances on screen. Keith Haring Keith Haring, born on May 4, 1958 in Reading, Pennsylvania, was a groundbreaking artist whose vibrant and socially conscious work became a defining part of the 1980s pop art movement. Herring's art was known for its bold lines, vivid colors, and recurring motifs of dancing figures, radiant babies, and barking dogs. He used public spaces, particularly the streets and subways of New York City, as his canvas, democratizing art by making it accessible to everyone. Herring moved to New York in 1978 to attend the School of Visual Arts, SVA, and soon immersed himself in the city's dynamic street art scene. Drawing inspiration from graffiti and pop culture, he began creating chalk drawings on the empty advertising panels of subway stations, quickly gaining attention for his distinct style. Herring's art was more than just visually striking. It carried powerful messages about social issues, particularly gay rights, anti-apartheid activism, and the AIDS crisis. 
His work was filled with a sense of urgency and energy, embodying the spirit of the 1980s New York art scene. As Herring's fame grew, he remained committed to using his platform for activism. He often created art to raise awareness about issues close to his heart, particularly LGBTQ rights and AIDS. His pieces featuring same-sex couples and critiques of homophobia were revolutionary, and his activism brought attention to the struggles faced by marginalized communities. In 1986, Herring opened The Pop Shop, a retail store in New York that sold his artwork at affordable prices, making his creations accessible to the public and further breaking down the barriers between fine art and commercial art. In 1987, Herring was diagnosed as HIV positive, a reality that fueled his activism even more. Rather than retreating, he used his art to confront the disease head on, establishing the Keith Herring Foundation in 1989 to provide funding for AIDS research and children's programs. His work took on new layers of meaning as he incorporated imagery related to life, death, and resilience in the face of adversity. Keith Herring passed away on February 16, 1990, at the age of 31, from AIDS-related complications. Despite his short life, Herring's impact on the art world and his activism left an enduring legacy. His murals, including the famous Crack is Whack mural in Harlem and pieces across the globe, continue to inspire new generations. The Keith Herring Foundation remains active today, supporting the causes he was passionate about, particularly in the fight against AIDS and for LGBTQ rights. Herring's art remains a vibrant symbol of love, unity, and social justice. The legacies of these remarkable individuals extend far beyond their fame, serving as powerful reminders of the challenges they faced and the incredible impact they had on culture, art, and society. Their stories continue to inspire conversations about acceptance, resilience, and the ongoing fight against HIV-AIDS. Which of these influential figures left the biggest impact on you? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and help support us by subscribing to the Famous People channel. Your support means everything as we continue to bring you more compelling stories from history.